All right. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. Uh, I know we have people from all across the, the world on different time frames. So uh, thank you guys for all joining us. So uh, I want to welcome you to Public Sector Innovation 101. Uh, this is really going to be an introduction to what public sector innovation is and how OECD views it, as well as problem framing. And I'll get into what that is shortly. So my name is Kevin Richmond. I'm an innovation specialist at OECD within the Observatory of Public Sector Innovation. And I'll talk about us uh, in a second. So I want to start with first saying that this is our first webinar that we've done like this. Um, I know the uh, background behind me is very bland and tan and not very exciting. So hopefully you're looking more at the slides than at me. But uh, I just want to go over some some quick rules. So first off, we have a lot of people uh, that have registered for this webinar, and I know we're we're uh, around over 100 people already on the webinar, and people will will likely be joining over the next 10 to 15 minutes. Um, so we have attempted to mute everyone's phone. With that said, I've uh, done previous webinars where we thought we had muted people's phone, and it doesn't work out that well. So please uh, try to mute your phone as well, so we can prevent. Um, uh, any uh, extra noise and, and preventing people's experiences. Um, with that said, though, we do want to encourage questions. Uh, so if you have any questions, there is a uh, chat box on WebEx, and feel free to type your questions in there. We'll, we're trying to make time at the end for if you have any questions to be able to answer them. Um, if not, though, uh, we're going to make sure to capture all those questions and answer them at a later time because uh, we do want to be responsive to them. And we know that there are generally a lot of questions around public sector innovation. Uh, also, we have a large mix of experience with the people that have registered. Um, based on just looking at the quick participant list, we have beginners, intermediates, we have expert practitioners. Um, one of the core things that we talk about within uh, public sector innovation is everyone really has a valuable perspective. Everyone has really interesting experiences and everyone brings value. Um, so whether you're a new person or an expert practitioner, feel free to ask questions, feel free to contribute. Um, we really want everyone to be engaged. And with everyone being engaged, we also want to hear your feedback. This is our first time really doing one of these webinars. Uh, based on how many people have registered, uh, there seems to be a, a need for these webinars. So we want to make sure that we continue to do them and that we make them valuable. Uh, so we're going to have a survey at the end that we're going to send you guys as well. It will be online um, trying to get some of your feedback. And lastly, innovation is also about fun. Um, uh, my colleagues told me not to say it's okay to laugh at my back jokes because it encourages me uh, to continue to say bad jokes, but uh, it, it really is okay, I, I promise, because um, I'm going to say them regardless. So uh, why Innovation 101? So one of the challenges of public sector innovation, so I was a uh, employee in the U.S. government for 10 years. I was not an innovation specialist to begin with. I did not study public sector innovation in school. I kind of fell into the position. But when you start in public sector innovation, public sector innovation feels like this, where you're looking at an amazing feat that is being accomplished that you've never seen before, and that in no way, shape, or form are you capable of actually doing that. I cannot program that robot to flip. I can't program a robot in general, but I certainly can't program it to do that. And what we end up doing is we celebrate these great achievements, but it also makes innovation seem out of reach for the ordinary person. What you miss through some of this is the other part of innovation, the sloppier part of innovation, where things fail, where things don't work out as anticipated, and all these steps that lead up to it. So what we talk about when we're talking about Innovation 101 is those building blocks that happen behind the scene. It's not about the achievements of first, second, or third place. It's not about celebrating these uh, massive, grand, huge successes that is what we end up hearing about for public sector innovation. Instead, it's celebrating all the little behind-the-scenes work that goes into it. It's breaking down innovation so that we can actually all do it in some capacity within our current jobs. So who is OPSI? 
uh, and who is the Observatory for Public Sector Innovation. So the observatory was founded in 2016, uh, and it was a partnership with the European Commission. And we really function in three ways. So we are uncovering what's next, and so that's looking at identifying innovative practices both within OECD and non-OECD countries. It's about being a trusted advisor to other countries. So we partner with countries on specific issues and specific instances to help them think of new ways to provide value to citizens and solve problems. And then we're trying to turn innovation into the new normal. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about what that means uh, in the next couple slides, but it's really about how does innovation get embedded into just the way that we do work. Um, the other thing that I'll point out that, that I think is really valuable is while our team is small, uh, and there's only seven of us, um, we've all been public sector innovators. We've all been public sector employees and, and have gone through some of these experiences, um, which I think has really helped to serve and, and keep us grounded in terms of what can actually work uh, in different countries and different contexts. So with that said, um, what do we mean by innovation? If I asked every single person to type out what they mean by innovation, we would get a uh, a different definition from every single person. Uh, you can do plenty of research on this, and we tried to develop an actual definition around what we mean by public sector innovation, and it didn't go well. Um, basically, everyone has their own, uh, and they like their own. So instead of creating uh, a new definition, we've said that there really isn't a specific definition. Um, innovation, you really know it when you see it, um, but it's really about context. What is innovative in one country may not be innovative in another country. What is innovative within one organization or sub-organization within the public sector may not be innovative for a different organization. And so it's really important is to understand and make sure that you actually are looking at the context, um, not just what we view as the, the innovative thing. With that said, there are three specific factors with, with innovation or three commonalities that we found. So one is that it's novel. And so when we say novel, it's about introducing new approaches. The second is implementation. So a lot of people think because you have creative ideas, that means you are innovative. And that is part of the innovation life cycle. That's part, uh, a critical part of, of being an innovator, but it's not the only part. And so we have to make sure that implementation is also, or sorry, that that uh, implementation is also a core focus. That when we are actually coming up with these ideas and we're actually selecting some of these ideas, that we're also uh, able to actually implement them. And lastly, that that implementation has impact. The impact piece is a really hard piece. It's really touchy when it comes to public sector innovation for how you measure impact. Um, because a lot of it is you don't know what is the right measurements. If you're truly doing something new and doing something innovative, um, you can hypothesize however you want for what you think is going to happen, um, but impacts may be years down the road and you may not even understand if your measurements are the correct measurements uh, to gauge the impact of your innovative activities. So, the other piece is, why are we doing this? Why does the public sector need innovation? Uh, so we recently did a uh, study of the innovation culture, the, the innovation system in Canada, and we're actually uh, doing one in Brazil right now. And through that, we've developed this model. And in this model, it's also talked about the, the reasons and the needs for public sector innovation. So the first is that the changing functions. So the world around us, I think all of us can agree over the past 10 years that, uh, and even beyond that, that there's constant change in our lives, um, especially in our, our private lives. And that with those changes, there's expectations that government changes as well. And so how does the government respond to those changing functions? Additionally, there's generally been considered a gap between the services that you get from the private sector and that you get in your daily lives compared to the services that you're currently getting in the public sector. And so the public sector is constantly putting a lot of effort and a lot of resources and really trying uh, 
oh, to, to push faster and harder um, just to stay in place, just to keep that gap between the private sector and the public sector for the services and value that is delivered uh, at the same level. So we need to rethink how we are delivering those values to be able to close that gap rather than just keep that gap the same. Also, there's really no room for spectators. We talk a lot about innovation capacity. So you hear a lot about innovation labs. Um, you hear a lot about training. Uh, you hear a lot about uh, idea spaces and, and different areas for these people to, to do these innovative ideas. But sometimes you feel like it's not for you. The challenge with that is it naturally limits a government's ability to actually innovate that there's no real room for spectators and there's no real room for people to be on the sidelines. Everyone needs to be engaged in this in some way, shape, or form. It doesn't mean everyone needs to be an expert, doesn't mean everyone needs to be a practitioner, but everyone should know how to engage in it. Also, uh, with the increasing changing functions uh, and with the changes of what's possible in our lives, uh, citizens and politicians want more. So how do we respond to them, to, to our citizens actually wanting more is really, really critical. And so if we don't respond to it, we end up with a risk of a mismatch, that we end up with government providing services that are no longer the services that citizens want. And so if there's that mismatch, we start creating issues with the value within the government. And lastly, innovation is a core competency. So as I said earlier, with no room for spectators and with trying to create this the new normal, the point is that innovation needs to be everywhere and anywhere because we never know when the next crisis is going to happen. We never know where innovation is going to be needed. And so by developing it and embedding it as a core competency, it gives us the ability to respond better to wherever we need to start rethinking and reimagining how government delivers for its citizens. So with that said, there's lots of ways to view innovation. So we talk about it really in three distinct ways. So the first is delivering on today. So when we think about the missions that our ministries have, that our departments have, that our sub-organizations have, uh, we start thinking about how we can deliver on those differently. So how you can start doing mission-driven innovation that's going to produce better value based on your, your current goals and what you really expect. But there's also around delivering on tomorrow. So we really talk about anticipatory innovation. So if you start thinking about weak signals that are out there, if you think about automated cars that 10 years ago we started talking about um, but didn't know when they were going to come, and now we're only a couple years away from them actually being a reality, and some people would say they could be a reality today of fully automated cars, um, and our governments still haven't figured out how to respond to those. So how do we start looking at what is coming in the future? What is happening, whether you look at AI, blockchain, or, or other areas, that, that these are things that are becoming more and more prevalent. How do we start innovating around those today, knowing that it's going to take us a while to figure it out? And lastly, ensuring readiness. How do we make sure that we're ready to innovate when we need to innovate? So <clears throat> it, it, it's really about capacity and capability and making sure that we have those in the right place uh, to be able to actively um, pursue different routes for, for delivering on mission, delivering on future. So when we talk about all this, when we look at it from the individual level and even from the team level, everyone has their core skills that are needed to do their job. And we're not saying that, that those skills um, aren't critical. So a lawyer still knows, needs to know how to be a lawyer. A, um, a policy analyst still needs to understand how to develop policy. Um, but there are some additional skills on top of that. And we call them really skill areas that are um, things that need to be added on to the current skills that people have to be able to think differently and get to different results. So the first that we talk about is iteration. When we mean iteration, we, we talk about instead of doing things how government traditionally does in three, five, 10 year plans, how do you do things quickly, cheaply, and with reduced risk to be able to get feedback quicker 
to achieve better results. Um, the uh, Canada is a great example of this, and I know we had a lot of Canadians signing up for this, that Canada had their um, experiment mandate that there had to be a certain amount of budget that went for programs to be able to experiment and to try new things. Um, so that's a great example of how some central governments are starting to push uh, iteration. Data literacy. I don't think anyone here would disagree that data is really important and really critical in the future uh, and, and today for how we understand impact, how we understand information, and how it can really um, provide greater insights into problems. User centricity. So this is one that's really critical um, that is starting to pick up a lot. You hear a lot about human-centered design in government right now. Uh, so user centricity is putting the actual end user at the center of what you do. So typically what governments have traditionally done is said that we work to make our process more efficient and we work to make ourselves more efficient um, and we don't really think about how that ends up impacting the end user. If we put the citizen in the center and start using that as our guide, it starts changing some of those conversations. Curiosity. So curiosity is about being able to ask questions and look for new ways of doing things. So you talk about horizon scanning. If you're a statistician, what are some of the cutting edge ways that people are using data to get better decisions? Um, are you willing and able to ask some of those tough questions? Are you willing to seek out new ways of doing things? Storytelling is about telling a compelling story to, and based on the audience that you have. Uh, you know, you talk a lot about, or we, we hear a lot about pitching right now and pitching projects. It's really about can you create a short, concise, memorable story that resonates with your audience more than resonates with yourself? And lastly, and always the one that causes a little bit of controversy, is insurgency. We have searched for a different word for this. Um, people have not been able to come up with one yet, but if, if anyone wants to come up with a better word for this, feel free to type it into the chat. Uh, but insurgency is about questioning the status quo. It's about trying things in new way. Um, a lot of times insurgents may be the people you think are a pain in the butt at work, the ones that are always saying that something may not work or something is broken and we need to fix it, but sometimes they're the best source of identifying what is wrong. And so when we talk about these, it's important to have these skills or, or these skill areas. But just as important is not just the ability or skill, but there's the, the abilities, opportunities, and motivation model, the, the AMO model. So it's also having the public sector have the opportunity to use these skills. A lot of these skills only become more effective uh, when you actually have the opportunity to practice them. Uh, and then the motivation, what is the incentive to use these skills? If I am an insurgent and I am talking and, and I am uh, getting reprimanded when I bring up that there's an issue around something, is there actually the proper motivation in place? And what have I learned is my motivation for actually pointing out problems? So, you know, looking at it beyond just can I do this skill into do I have the opportunity and motivation to use the skill provides a more complete package for how we look at individual skills in the skill areas. So that talks really about a, a high level concept of what innovation is. And now we want to get a little more into how you do innovation. So we developed uh, an innovation life cycle, and there are lots of innovation life cycles that are out there. Um, some are 20 things long, some are only three steps. Uh, so we've really settled on a, a six step process. And so it's about identifying problems. Are you actually solving for the right thing? Generating ideas. How do you come up with new ideas and be more inclusive and collaborative about how you develop uh, different ideas and generate different ideas to solve the problem. Developing proposals, how do you start filtering those ideas uh, into which ones you're going to actually start really diving into? Um, then implementing, uh, evaluating, and diffusing. So evaluation, pretty straightforward. Diffusion is something public sector has traditionally struggled with. Um, how do you identify those best practices and diffuse those lessons learned across the organization? And not just for successes, but also for failures, which we don't really like to talk about. So 
we thought it would be really good for Innovation 101 and, and really for our future structure for these, um, for the first series of webinars to go through the different sections of innovation, the, the different pieces of this life cycle. Um, so we're gonna start with the first stage, which is really identifying problems, but know that even though this is a circle, uh, it doesn't just happen where you go from one step to the next to the next. Um, as you start going through this process, uh, you may take a step back and realize that the ideas that you had generated aren't solving the problem, so you need to generate new ideas or you need to get better at identifying the problems. Um, so it's not just a, a linear process as well, and you may have to jump around in it. Do we have any questions thus far? Hmm. That's a really good question. So the one of the biggest challenges is in the end, you have to identify who your end user is. So if your end user of the actual policy is citizens, then there should be a user centricity to that. And where we've seen uh, in countries is that as you start bringing users into the actual process, so this doesn't mean a survey, but this means actually co-designing with users um, it starts breaking down those barriers because generally what ends up happening is policy happens over here, implementation happens over here, and rarely do they actually meet up. And so implementation, which generally has frontline experience, never ends up talking and, and influencing policy or rarely ends up influencing policy. And policymakers rarely understand the implementation. If we start moving into the politics side of it, which is where, uh, depending how uh, the country is set up, that starts getting a little more tricky. Um, but there is a big push within OECD and within OECD countries about evidence-based policy making. So there is starting to be a push uh, around how do we make better policy and how do we do policy experimentation as well. And so we'll, we'll do one more question, then we'll jump forward. And, and uh, I want to make sure that we, we have enough time for questions at the end as well. Sure. So the question was around how do we merge uh, where most of the tools are uh, about designing, and yet we talked about the characteristics being impact um, and and uh, implementation. So uh, we were going to talk about this at the end, but I can talk about it really quickly. Uh, one of the things that we had discovered. Um, is that we didn't need to make a toolkit around any of this stuff um, because there were literally hundreds that were already out there. And some of them explicitly talk um, around implementation. The evaluation piece is extremely tough. Um, it's something that every single innovation group is, is challenged with, is how you measure your impact. And that could be whether you're trying to build capacity and so your, your impact is attempting to build innovators and how do you measure that? And even innovative projects. Um, and if you're doing 10 innovative projects that all have different outcomes, how do you measure over our, overall like what your innovation impact is? Um, so the evaluation piece is, is a challenge. But for the implementation piece, we have created a meta toolkit or a compendium of, of the various toolkits that are being used in the public and private sector that were all uh, available for use. And we've compiled them into one place. Um, now, the challenge is that toolkits have uh, a really good value, but they have to be used in the right context. And so we're starting to play with how can we help people match up their needs and what they're attempting to do with the right toolkit. But we're really at the early stages of that. Um, but we'll make sure when we send out uh, the links for everything that that the, the toolkit compendium is on there. So you can see all the various toolkits uh, that are happening uh, uh, for public sector innovation around the world. And many of them do cover the implementation side. So when we talk about problem framing, uh, I don't know how many people are familiar with this, but this is a, an MRI machine. And this one is specifically an MRI machine for children. Uh, and so GE had developed a world-class MRI machine and had spent 
hundreds of millions of dollars on research and development creating this MRI machine. They were very proud of it. It was by far the best when it was released. Um, but they were starting to get complaints from hospitals. And so the, the main engineer, his name was Doug Dietz, and he has a great YouTube video. That if, if you ever just go, uh, YouTube like GE Doug Dietz, um, around how he went to actually observe the, the MRI machine in action. And the children were terrified of it to the point that 80% of them had to be sedated. And sedation in children uh, can really mess with them neurologically. So you want to do it as, as limited as possible. And for the most part, children shouldn't need to be um, sedated during MRIs. So they could have framed the problem that there was a huge design issue. They could have framed it that the, the technology itself had failed because they didn't design something that was actually effective in, in getting results. But instead, they reframed the problem. And it turned into talking about the experience of using the MRI machine. And so you can't avoid the MRI machines being noisy. They weren't going to scrap this project that they had spent hundreds of millions of dollars developing. Instead, what they ended up doing is creating an experience out of it. So now what they do is technicians have a story to tell uh, the children as they get in the, the MRI machine. So this is just one of them, but there are pirate ships, there's outer space. Um, rather than technicians telling kids to sit still, um, technicians are now telling children a story that incorporates even the noises from the machine. And so sedation rates have gone from 80% down to 10% uh, or under 10% using this machine. And if we looked at the traditional problem of just sedation rates, um, or that the, there was something wrong with the machine, we may not have gotten to this solution that was just a couple hundred dollars in paint and developing a script. So how do we do this in government? So there's a traditional design methodology that's the double diamond. The first diamond being about framing the problem and the second one being about s defining the solution and finding the solution. So you'll see that uh, in defining the problem that you actually spend a lot of time in the problem space. You actually are looking to discover and understand the problem and investigate the problem to narrow down and figure out what is the actual problem you're trying to achieve. On the other side, you're trying to ideate. You're trying to come up with new ideas for how we develop a solution and then, and, and then slowly narrow that list down to uh, a recommended either one solution or a couple solutions that want to be tested. The challenge with this double diamond, as nice as it is in theory, is that most public servants start here. They start after the first diamond. You're either told that uh, when you're given a project that this is the solution or this is the problem that we're trying to solve, and we're going to give you only the amount of time necessary to talk about solutions. Or you may start at stage four. We already have a solution, and your job is just to implement it. So by ignoring this first stage, I don't want to, to try to say that bosses potentially aren't thinking about the problem. But generally, uh, there is a challenge that not people aren't often spending as much time defining the problem as they are defining the solution. And so if we operate in this mentality, uh, and we just constantly are making sure that we're doing new things and that we're solution focused, we actually end up ending up fairly disappointed. Um, we aren't getting the results that we expect. We don't end up getting uh, the actual return on investment or the impact that we assume. And everyone's constantly churning and thinking that the solutions are the problem. So it's a new solution, new solution. No one's ever backing up to look at the problem itself. So why are we bad at this? So we actually developed a life cycle report uh, that, that is actually on our website around problem framing. Uh, and so these are some of the things that we had discovered based on our observations and conversations with innovators um, across the world in, in this field. So first is that the government or public sector really likes to push quick responses more than the right response. We have seen that there is a problem. Our job is to immediately solve the problem. The challenge is the problem that's directly in front of us may not be the actual problem. It may be a symptom. So if you're trying to solve a problem around a service being too slow, 
it may not be the actual service that's the issue. It may be a policy that's behind it. And by just trying to simply solve what we think is a symptom, you may actually miss the problem completely. Additionally, there's generally new information that's constantly out there that changes how we could potentially view the problem. Uh, and as we look at that new information and as we start really analyzing the problem, lots of times problems become really large, complex, and unwieldy for one person. Um, it can be really intimidating when you think you're solving a problem uh, that you understand, and as you learn more about the problem, you understand how big the problem is, and that you may not be able to under that you may not be able to solve it yourself, and it can get rather intimidating. Um, and sometimes it's not just intimidating; you, you may end up not being able to have the responsibility or have the autonomy to be able to solve this problem anymore. It may move into other areas, other departments, other suborganizations where you don't have the ability to get them involved get them engaged or to get them sold on actually solving this problem. Additionally, problems can actually change where we think that we understand the problem based on previous information, the problem can continue to evolve. Um, and sometimes it's a completely new problem that we actually don't even understand yet. So uh, I talked a lot about new information lots of times being the spur for uh, for problem framing or, or for, for trying to frame a problem. So what we looked at and what we proposed in our research is that new information is the start to start asking questions to help frame a problem better. So you receive new information, you look at what is known, you look at what is possible, you look at what is expected, what is actually needed, and then finally, what is the problem? And by going through these steps of asking these questions and exploring each of these questions independently, you start to get a new appreciation for actually what is the problem that you're trying to solve. But just like the life cycle and just like anything in innovation, it's never linear. Um, it's also more of a cycle with information, how quickly new information is produced. Uh, it's never just going to be a one-time thing. There's going to constantly be new information. There should be new feedback, um, as that's one of the the things that we talk about in terms of designing solutions and being user-centric is that we're constantly receiving feedback and information to evaluate if we understand the problem, if we understand the situation, and look at do we need to tweak our solutions? Do we need to completely scrap something and innovate and make something completely new and novel? Um, it should be something that is always reevaluated and always looked at. So now that we've talked about problem framing in general, how can we get more specific as to how we can do problem framing better as individuals or even as a group? So again, some very quick and easy tips for how to do this. Um, the first is clarifying intent. What are we actually trying to achieve? So not the specific customer satisfaction has gone down. We want it to go up. Like, what are we actually trying to achieve as we're trying to figure out what this problem is? Also, making assumptions explicit. So this is one of the biggest challenges I faced when I was in the government, is how do you separate facts from assumptions? Lots of people take anecdotal information where they hear something once or twice and assume that it is fact. And they bring those into the conversation as facts by actually making a list of what we know as definitive facts versus assumptions, it allows us to challenge assumptions. It allows us to dive deeper to make sure those assumptions are actually correct and make sure that we're spending enough time to frame the problem correctly. Also, when we're framing the problem, we should always avoid jumping to conclusions. Very often, and it, it happens in every organization, if you spend a couple hours or a couple days looking at a problem, you think you have solved it and you understand the problem completely and start jumping into the solution mode. Um, it's a really easy trap to fall into, uh, but it's one that we should always try to avoid and make sure that we really do understand the problem space and call ourselves out when we start just immediately jumping to solutions. Additionally, we talk about connecting with others. There are a lot of people that have information um, on any problem or any experience that we are facing. 
So how do we make sure that we're being inclusive and collaborative when we're trying to frame an actual problem? How are we bringing in people that may have different experiences than our own and a different perspective in our own that may help broaden our understanding of the issue? Uh, the, the next one is reframing the problem. So how do you reframe the problem in uh, different perspectives to look at it slightly differently? Um, so that, that could be saying that you have a problem um, with, let's say, the weather uh, and that it's always too hot outside. But instead, what if you reframe the problem around clothing? And are you dressed appropriately for the weather? And do you have the appropriate clothing for the weather? So it's around approaching the problem in different ways um, that make it easier to um, look at different solutions. So there's lots of different ways that people are already trying to make sure that they're framing a problem correctly. And so while this is not an inclusive list by any stretch of the means, uh, this is the list of what we see as the common problem identification tools and strategies. So there's a lot here. And in general, uh, for people that are especially beginners, um, a lot of the information that I'm throwing at you may be new. A lot of the language and verbiage may be new. Um, there's a lot to unpack in all of this. We could talk about all of these different subjects uh, for a fairly long period of time. Um, and we only have an hour. So. If we don't unpack something, if you have a question about language that we're using, about vocabulary, feel free to ask it. We will make sure to unpack it for you um, afterwards. Uh, additionally, we have lots of additional resources that do unpack this for you already. Uh, it's just we we are limited on time, and we want to make sure that, that we get through as much as possible. But again, this is really a journey, and this is the start of a journey for, for many of you. So therefore, um, we want to continue the conversation after the webinar as well. But with that said, uh, we took all of the different uh, ways in which uh, you can um, look at problem framing. And I, I'm sorry, I forgot one, which was the experimentation one, which we had talked about earlier, about how do you experiment and how do you send signals into the problem space and how do you actually look at uh, experimenting along the problem space, not to look for solutions, but to better understand the problem. But among all of these, uh, there are a lot of tools that are already out there. So I'm sure everyone is familiar with dashboards and no one really needs to uh, it be explained what a dashboard is. Um, horizon scanning is really looking at uh, what is happening across the horizon in the problem space that you're, you're looking at. And so that may be a different organization, how they may be solving the same problem, a different country, even a different problem space that may have figured out and had similar problems to you. Um, design thinking, uh, again, this is uh, a uh, methodology. Uh, we, we generally call it as, as human-centered design. Uh, which is really around user centricity and make sure that you're designing experiences and services and products that fit the citizen need. Um, systems thinking is really looking through a, a complete lens of everything that is going on and all the actors to fully understand the problem. Uh, we actually have a, a couple of pieces of literature on systems thinking and how it applies to the public sector. Um, behavioral insights and actually understanding how people behave and how people actually make decisions is becoming more popular. There's lots of behavioral insight groups now popping up across government. Peer-to-peer um, -peer learning, there's lots of people that are solving or challenged with solving the same problem. So how can you work amongst your peers um, and amongst your network? Um, learning organizations, how can you constantly be looking for new methods and new ways of doing things within an organization? And then finally, innovation labs. Um, which there are lots of ways to structure an innovation lab, and that's probably a whole different webinar unto itself about how um, innovation labs are working, uh, where they are effective, and how to structure them. Um, but all of them have different strengths and weaknesses, and so it's important to note uh, lots of times, uh, in my experience and many of the experiences of my colleagues in government, um, they would just look at dashboards, and dashboards would give data that say, we understand the problem because we know what we're trying to measure, and we're not achieving that result. But dashboards never really articulate the why those things are not being achieved and what the actual problems are. So it's important to understand how each of these uh, can benefit you, how they help frame problems, but also where some of their weaknesses are and where they may not be as helpful. 
So with all of that, um, one of the things that, that we try to avoid is just talk at the 30,000 foot level about innovation the entire time. So we wanted to give some practical advice um, and a practical exercise that can really help frame problem framing for you um, and can really be applicable no matter what your situation is. So the, one of the easiest ones and the most simple uh, exercises that you can do is just called the five whys. So the five whys is really simple. You define the problem. And so that is how you define the problem currently right now based on your understanding. And you start asking why that's happening. And you continue to ask why that is happening to get a better understanding of a situation. Let me let me go through an example that, that I went through personally. Um, I was in charge of customer experience um, in the agency that I worked for within the US government. And we were constantly told uh, that we needed to improve our customer satisfaction score. Um, and it wasn't going up for five straight years. It did not go up. And so we would ask the question, why is that happening? And we'd go around the room, and this room was only filled with internal people. It was not filled with anyone that were our customers. It was not filled with anyone that was our end users. It was filled with our internal group. And everyone went around and anecdotally said why this was the problem, and they were 100% sure it was the problem, and no one actually agreed with what the problem was. Also, no one could actually factually state that those were the actual problems. And so once we started using some of the tools like uh, clarifying assumptions versus facts, we realized that we didn't actually understand the problem space and that we probably needed to connect with our end users a little bit more to unpack the why. So when we went to our end users, they said two primary things. One, that you are too complex. And two, that you are too slow. And so if we start using those as that is why our customer satisfaction are staying low, we start to unpack, okay, why are we too complex? And it then starts getting into our process. And so you start looking at your process and you're like, well, why is the process the way that it is? And it starts getting into both the history of the organization as well as the policy. And so as you start getting to a higher and higher level for why these things are, you understand one, the full extent of the problem. Uh, where it gets all the way to laws. Um, but two, it may give you a level to attack a problem in a different way than we would have approached it before. So rather than just worrying about speed of delivery through and uh, complexity to deal with us um, because of a cumbersome process, it turned out a lot of the issue when we were talking about a cumbersome process was no one knew the process very easily and it wasn't transparent as to what the process actually was. Um, and that was because our website was actually really, really confusing. And so through all of this, we made really easy tweaks about improving our website that directly improved customer satisfaction. Now that is one example of many but again, it was really using the why methodology of the, the five whys to start unpacking further and making sure that we understand completely why each of these things are happening to be able to come up with a solution that is clearly different than the solutions we've come up with previously. So with that, I will uh, we'll do a, a couple more questions and then I will call my colleague Rebecca over who's gonna talk about how we can continue this conversation further. So, um, mm -hmm. uh, so one question from Andras is, in my organization, there's a lot of grandiose talk and activity about innovation, innovation lab, ideation sessions, innovation challenges, et cetera, while our everyday processes are grossly inefficient and outdated. How can we balance a focus on big breakthrough innovations and more down-to-earth incremental innovations? Yeah, that's a, so the, the question was about, one, uh, a lot of leaders and innovators, um, or a lot of leaders talk about innovation a lot. And we talk about the, the stages in evolution, especially for leadership and innovations, that it goes from, we don't believe in innovation or we don't fully understand innovation to, we like to talk about innovation a lot, but we're not actually changing any of our underlying issues, um, to we believe we're doing innovation because we have 
uh, a couple of innovative projects that are on five years that only a limited amount of people get to work on um, to finally that next step, which is our organization understands innovation and realize that ideas can come from anywhere. That last step is really hard to find. Um, what we typically tell practitioners um, in the public sector is really own your 50 or 100 meters. So what do you have direct control over? What do you have influence over? And what don't you have control over? And to focus on where you have control and where you have influence. You may be part of a 20 step process and only responsible for two of those steps, but can you do those two steps better? Can you start driving change among other people and influence other people to adopt a different way of thinking about it to improve other steps along the way and start improving how you do things? Um, I think when we start looking at innovative organizations, it's not just grand ideas come from anywhere that's gonna transform a whole organization. Um, there's gonna be only a couple of those, but how are we constantly learning about new ways of doing things? How are we constantly looking within our own lives and with our own work, how we can do better? Um, and so some of that requires testing and doing things in the shadow and, and uh, not doing anything illegal by any, any stretch of the means, but by uh, testing things quietly and doing things quietly because you know it's not actually that encouraged. Um, to then talking to your boss and saying, here are some things I've been thinking about. Do I have permission to go try some of these things? Um, one of the other ways that we've seen some of these barriers be broken is actually send leaders to innovation training. So rather than just talking about it, have them go through a design cycle, even for a short one in three days. Um, show them what iteration is and what experimentation is. Show them what prototyping is so that when you start doing those things, they better understand what it is and what the value of it is. So uh, the question was, how do innovators and insurgents uh, promote innovation? Oh, yeah, advocate in a conservative, in a conservative culture. Um, um, I would, this is going to be way over generalizing, but most public sectors are fairly conservative. Um, most of them are risk averse, uh, as uh, whether it be due to political issues or media issues or just not wanting to fail or this is the way that we've done things previously, um, combined with your using taxpayer funds, there's always going to be that issue. Um, one of the biggest challenges with innovation is that you're going to run up to stumbling blocks a lot. We talk a lot of internally about resiliency, that innovators need to constantly be willing to push to not get discouraged to create a network of other innovators that are out there that can continuously encourage each other. Um, but it, it's not easy. And so it should always be advocated for. Know that groups like OECD and the observatory that works with national governments at, at fairly high levels across OECD countries are advocating for this as well. Um, it's being advocated for by citizens. It's being advocated for by the public sector. Uh, and. and from the bottom all the way to the top in some areas. Um, it's never going to be easy. Um, it is very hard to get a giant organization and a mammoth organization like a public sector and even organizations within the public sector to move forward. Uh, but that shouldn't stop us from trying and that shouldn't discourage us from continuing to push. Um, so that, that's what I would say. I, I don't have a perfect answer to that because I don't think anyone has figured that out because if they did, um, our governments would be going through some major transformations. It's, it's something that's very relatable to innovators uh, across the world. Last question here. Um, on five years of tension between the prototype mentality in the innovation sector and the equal opportunities mentality of government, governments only want to implement what works for sure. They don't want to test it. How can we help governments take a step forward towards testing, prototyping, and advancing truth and security? You know, it, it's fairly ironic that the government, the uh, sorry, so the, the question was, um, how do we push the idea of prototyping, experimenting, and iterating um, over what government's traditional model is, which is we study some, I, I'm taking liberties with the question, but we study something for five years, we analyze it to death, and then we implement it. Um, and, and that there's the tension there between those two models. Um, I always find it ironic that the public sector thinks that those five-year plans are uh, an effective methodology for major transformation plans. 
one, um, none of us can predict what's going to happen in the next five years. So thinking that we can uh, analyze anything five, 10 years down the road and, and be a perfect predictor of the future, um, I think is is fairly inaccurate. And, and there's not many people that are very good at that. If you are very good at it, you're probably very, very rich right now and not on this webinar. Um, in addition, uh, I think government has seen many times from countless failures, type in whatever government you want with uh, project failure, and you're going to see hundreds and thousands of projects that have spent millions of dollars on projects that are not going to work or that end up not working whatsoever or become a sunk cost where we have spent tens to hundreds of millions of dollars on something and we've decided that we need to continue to spend money on it because it would be an embarrassment to call something a failure. Um, I don't, I'm not gonna call out any specific governments or any specific examples, but I know all of you can pro are probably nodding and thinking of plenty of examples of this. So the idea that that is actually a successful methodology um, is the thing that we need to overcome is to get rid of that thinking that that actually is more successful. Um, the only way to do that is to get people to roll up their sleeves and try a different methodology. Um, it is scary at first to say we're going to experiment with something. We don't know the outcome of it and we need $50,000 to do it. Um, can be scary because that $50,000 may end up not providing a solution. Uh, but it's also providing then better insights. So when you do finally make a bigger investment, you have a better idea that what works. Um, there was uh, uh, one of the founders of LinkedIn, Reid Hoffman, um, is on the Department of Defense within the United States uh, Innovation Board. And he talked about the mentality of Silicon Valley isn't around um, celebrating failure. And the idea that celebrating failure in the government doesn't work. Um, it's not a smart tactic. Instead, what he said was, we never know the right answer at first. And the goal instead is to try to study the problem, try to find three solutions that we think are the best solutions at the time, and test all three quickly and cheaply. And more often than not, all three are going to fail in some way. And we're going to learn from all of those. So when we finally decide to make a big investment, um, we do it with more information, more knowledge, a higher chance of success, um, and we're able to see results quicker. And so that's the mentality that we're trying to encourage. Um, it's not easy to do, uh, but the biggest challenge is showing people that that other mentality isn't nearly as effective as people think it is, and it doesn't reduce risk nearly as much as people think it does. If it does, we wouldn't have thousands of examples of how governments end up use, spending millions of dollars over 10-year projects that end up having minimal effect. So um, with that said, continue to ask your questions. Um, we're clearly monitoring them, and I, I'm sorry for um, having the awkwardness of our, our first webinar. Maybe next time we'll, we'll mic up the person actually responding to you, who I think is also under the name Kevin Richmond, but it, obviously it's not me. Um, but uh, I also want to talk about, for our last couple minutes, how we continue this conversation. So I want to call over uh, my colleague and the person that uh, makes these conversations possible, uh, Rebecca Santos. Hi, thanks for that, Kevin. Um, hi, everyone, and we're so glad that you were able to join our first webinar. Um, we really wanted to give you um, a dedicated space where we can continue these conversations and to continue the learning. Um, so what I would encourage you to do, as you can see on this final slide, we've got instructions on how to join our community group. So if you go to the OPSI website, you'll find um, on the right-hand side an option to register for the community group. And once you've created a profile for yourself, you'll be able to find on your personal dashboard um, the option to click the Innovation Skills 101 group. Um, so this group is going to be, um, from this afternoon uh, onwards, um, the sort of the hub or the place where we put all our resources that are relevant to the kind of learning we're trying to take you through here. So at the moment, what we've put so far is an OPSI flyer. So if you really want to read more about what our team does or how we work, we've got a flyer there. We've also posted a survey. So 
Once you've had a moment to digest your learning from this webinar, you can give us your feedback about what worked, what didn't, um, and what sort of topics in this area that you'd be interested in hearing more about so that we can continue to tailor our webinars and other content um, to your needs. And it, uh, you'll also have the opportunity once you've joined the group to post any questions you have um, and to befriend other members if you want to start having conversations with peers internationally. So that's what this space is about and we really encourage you to sign up to the community platform and get active on it. Um, in addition to the community group, I'd also direct your attention to our OPSI website more broadly. On it, you'll find a wealth of information about the kind of projects we run, um, blogs by Kevin in this subject area as well, um, and other kind of resources that might be able to help you in your day-to-day -day work. Um, and lastly, we really encourage you also to sign up to our newsletter. Uh, we send out our newsletter every two weeks and it's basically the way that we communicate directly with you to give you all the research um, that we're doing first, um, any events that might be happening in your city or across the world that are relevant to you, um, and just to stay in touch. So please, please consider signing up and we'd love to chat to you um, on those platforms and on those mediums as well. Thanks. Thanks, Rebecca. So with that, uh, we conclude really our first webinar. I hope this was informative for you all. I hope it was somewhat entertaining and, and, uh, and lively and hopefully I gave, made you laugh at least once or twice and, and uh, try to make it a, a little more peppy than sometimes where stuffy webinars can be. Um, Again, I, I encourage you, as Rebecca said, to go onto our website. We all will send um, an email out for everyone that attended as well to with these links. Um, the presentation is also already on that group as well. So uh, we're going to hold that hostage. And you've got to come to our website to get our presentation and the information that we talked about today. Um, and lastly, uh, any questions that we didn't answer, we'll post within that group and we'll, we'll post um, our responses. Um, so that's that's it for our first webinar. Thank you guys so much. Um, we really appreciate you um, being on this journey with us as this was our first time that we've done anything like this. We hope it was a positive experience and we hope to uh, continue this conversation in the future. So thank you guys so much.